Hi, everyone, and welcome uh, to, I think, now the second meeting of um, the SCAR uh, Research Seminar, um, which I would like, sort of like to start off by saying is, sort of, is uh, supported by sort of generous grant for the Point of View Fund, so thanks to Kevin uh, uh, for that. And, and um, um, so, so this is our second meeting, and of course the purpose of the seminar is to uh, bring in outside speakers, outside, uh, outside GMU, uh, to come in and sort of present ongoing work, not something that's already been published, not something that that's already done, but something that's sort of in the middle of being done. Um, so we can have a, a, a sense of new and exciting research going on in the field of conflict broadly understood. Um, so our first, um, our first presenter was Aydin Salehan from, from uh, uh, Political Science, who had, gave us a very statistical uh, analysis of, of abuse of civilians in civil war. Today we'll be bring us something very different. Uh, Rochelle Davis comes to us from uh, Georgetown University, uh, where she is an, as uh, an associate professor. Um, uh, Rochelle, I would add, also got her PhD from uh, a place near and dear to my heart, the University of Michigan, uh, um, so, which is, I think is very awesome. Uh, um, uh, Rochelle, um, Rochelle's first book uh, was entitled Palestinian Villages, so, sorry, Palestinian Village Histories, Geographies of the Displaced from Stanford University Press. Um, and she'll be presenting uh, work from what is sort of her, her, sort of her main, her sort of kind of primary project right now. Um, and so this is kind of very exciting to have her here, and we're, we're very, very happy to have you here. So, uh, Rochelle, the uh, floor is yours. I'm going to stand up, and I have a kind of a voice issue. So if you can't hear me, just holler, and I'll make sure I talk louder. Um, and thank you all for coming and for looking over or reading very closely um, my paper that I sent you. Let me give you a couple of sort of introductory notes before I get started on the meat of the paper. Um, this paper is for a, as I note on there, it's for a multidisciplinary textbook for upper-level upper undergraduates, and it's pitched to teach them about sort of Middle East and the world. And I debated when I was thinking about what to send you, whether I should send you something that was going to be used in a pedagogical sense or something more sort of kind of art academic, and I, I thought I could really use your feedback on kind of sort of how to, how to present something to undergraduates to sort of teach about this. And part of the reason I think I need help doing some of that is, and this is the second part of what I wanted to introduce, is my own sort of positioning in dealing with this material. I'm an anthropologist, and so we always like to talk about our position, um, and I will do so only briefly. Um, but I am an anthropologist of the Arab world. I'm fluent in written, spoken um, uh, Arabic, and I do a, most of a, a lot of my work in Arabic. Um, and I've lived in the Arab world for more than 10 years. So to approach this topic for me was challenging on a number of levels, and I tried to approach sort of the U.S. military as I would any other subject, which was to sort of try and learn their vocabulary and language and sort of... Um, try to understand the, the way they are seeing the world from their perspective. Um, but the other thing, so, so there's been a number of anthropologists who have worked on this issue of the, of the U.S. military and culture and anthropology. Primarily, they've been working around the human terrain system and the human terrain teams. I'm personally speaking so very tired of those debates that as you can tell, I kind of don't even engage them in this paper. But, but one of my suggestions to my colleagues who were working on this and one of my critiques of how anthropology has approached this, and I think it's also in some ways you know, sort of a partial critique of my own work, is that we have not done the work to go into the, into the military community and really try to understand that. On the flip side, no one has gone into the Iraqi or Afghan communities and tried to understand their experiences in this war. And I've done that in a kind of a, sep a couple separate research projects. And I haven't been able to incorporate them into this paper. But I did, I mean, a, a couple of research assistants and I did over 50 interviews with Iraqis about their experiences with US forces in, um, in Iraq. So that's kind of another project that I'm sort of working on, struggling with, as we all do. Um, and that will be part of the larger book project that this project is part of. So the larger book will be. This would be, you know, just a partial sort of bit of it, and the larger book will also incorporate many more interviews with with troops, a lot more of the kind of training material, and well as interviews with Iraqis, um, and and um, a little bit more. I've also been working on this project since 2006, sort of collecting material as well. Throughout the process, I've meant to have this book finished by now, but I got sidetracked by Syria 
and all that is happening in Syria. And I, I lived in Syria for um, quite a few summers, and um, and I have worked a lot on Iraqi refugees in both Syria and Jordan. And so Syria has completely kind of taken over um, my my spare time, the one normally uses to write. Um, but I also think as Syria develops, it's becoming an interesting um, comparison with Iraq and what happened in Iraq um, both pre and post-2003, and I think Syria is going to give us some really um, unfortunately rich material with which to kind of think about these two, these two places and what happens in kind of overthrowing, trying, overthrowing a regime and trying to overthrow a regime. <coughs> so my, my work is really trying to understand why the military took this cultural turn in 2006 and tried to incorporate the idea of culture into sort of military practice and strategy and tactics, etc. And one of the things I was really um, keen on trying to understand was what had hap what was going on before the production of the counterinsurgency manual. Do I have something to click to I think just take the mouse up there with me? I think we we'll do, yeah. Sorry, I forgot that part. You should just be able to click, I think it's down at the bottom, oh, is the next is right there. Okay. Sorry about that. So this is Field Manual 3-24, Counterinsurgency. Um, you can see it was, came out of the headquarters of the Department of the Army, and uh, the Marines were involved in it as well. And Chapter 3 is kind of known as the culture chapter, um, and various people have addressed it, taken it apart, um, and dealt with it. But in the paper, one of the things I sort of try and put forward is that why all of a sudden this concern with culture, and why does it become kind of so so relevant? And it took me a long time to figure this out, and this may have been sort of totally obvious to other people, but I <coughs> am not, I haven't read a lot that has suggested this, but my, my the premise that I put in the paper and why I have that long sort of historical section is that because the U.S. military was given a task by the U.S. government to go in and overthrow the, the regimes, both in Iraq and, and, and the Taliban in Afghanistan, that they went and did that, but that there was no long-term plan. So you see in Iraq in particular this sort of shock and awe campaign and the complete destruction of the infrastructure of Iraq. I mean, on, on all levels. And the kind of sort of, kind of, <coughs> so the regime was overthrown very quickly and then there was no plan for anything else. And it's taken me a long time to really understand that, then this is where I kind of, the, my retrospection as an anthropologist I think was sort of both naive and also useful for me, is that the military is given a task by the government and, and that this isn't necessarily, I mean, I'm trying not to use words of fault, etc., but the military did what it was told. And the Department of Defense under Rumsfeld then decided that state and aid um, should be sidelined in the rebuilding of Iraq and handed that task largely to the military. So the military made no preparations for this and had no kind of real idea how to do this. And instead, they were concerned with security and their own security and locking down Iraq in particular in this post-2003 period. So the, the intervening years after, after the invasion in 2003, and you see it more currently in, in Afghanistan, involved incredible levels of violence um, within Iraqi society, sorry, towards Iraqis in Iraq and now more, I mean, and also somewhat in Afghanistan. What that meant was, though, that they had to then find something that was going to help them, and the answer that they came up with was, we need to treat, treat, teach people and teach soldiers how to do sort of nation building um, more correctly. And I find nation building, in the case of, of Iraq in particular, a particularly offensive term. I mean, they had a nation, they had a country, they had all the institutions of a nation and a country. So to call it nation building, I think, is, is one of the ways of the many where people just miss the kind of, the kind of sense of what, um, of what was there. And I'll, I'll show you a, a, kind of an example of that. Um, 
I also think um, part of this DOD um, misstep is too kind a word, but misstep was to put in place the Coalition Provisional Authority, um, under, which was under the Department of, De of Defense. And they made multiple missteps very early on, and that was one of the main, uh, main problems. So I did the interviews in 2007 of people who had served in Iraq between 2003 and 2006, and asked them about the cultural training they had received and what um, what they had um, been prepared, how they had been prepared to go to Iraq. And I, in another paper, I broke all of that down. Very, f they said so they had a whole varying level of um, what they had been taught or told or what kind of material they had been given. But at the same time, both um, the, the, the US military as well as contractors were really trying to prepare things. So one of the things they came up that this this is a, a company called Tactical Language and Culture, and this is called Tactical Iraqi, I'm pretty sure. And so these were these, this is from 2007, these, there's just a screenshot. You could, you would hear these voices speak, and you were these little com CGA, these, these computer-generated figures, and you would have this kind of interaction. Almost all of the training has in the early phases was done via human beings that taught other people, um, taught the, 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 the troops in small groups or in larger groups how to, you know, what, what about the Iraqi history, about Arabs, about Muslims, about Afghans, etc. Um, now there are almost, or many more of them are all computer based and they therefore can reach a much wider audience. I'll, I'll address that. I mean, I addressed that a little bit in the. Um, so, sorry, I need to go to this. This video. I want to show you a video. This, this thing is too smart for me. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, there you go. So this is the Air Force Culture and Language Center, and they have a an anthropologist who runs this, and who is also a, a Marine. Was a, was a Marine. I don't think he is anymore. Um, You're always a Marine. Oh, okay. He's still a Marine. <laughs> um, oh. oh, there we go. Program. Cross-cultural competence is a critical skill for all airmen, and this type of reality-based training will positively impact mission success and save lives. As you proceed through these reality-based situations, you will be tested based on your previous training and experiences to react appropriately. Here is your culture vest. Visual, expeditionary skills. There is an old Arab proverb that says, A guest is a gift from Allah. I'm hoping to make this a new day for us. Build some bridges of understanding with the locals. In Islam, be very careful how you speak of religion. You could quickly lose a friend. Afghanistan presents a whole new set of challenges. And it presents a cultural minefield for those untrained. I'm new here, but I'm sure we can work things out. Yes, you are new. And you talk before you listen. In America, you must win at all costs. Winning a game, an argument, one winner, you have one loser. Not so much in Afghanistan. Please accept this scimitar as my gift. Gracious this scimitar belongs to him. Mother, how could you do such a thing? The gift is his. He is our guest. And I am honored, but I cannot take such a prized family treasure from you. I wish for future visitors to be able to enjoy such a prized family treasure. You need to understand their ways and customs. You know, they don't think like Americans, Anne. They say America. You come in here, and you think that you will fix all the things. I have lived here my whole life. This is not your village. This is our country. What can the Americans do? 
can they protect our safety? Next time they will kill one of us to send message to you. Everything happens according to Allah's will. Muslims believe that the time of death, like birth, is determined by Allah. Remember, this is not America. He says you're the missing commander. You make the call. You just destroyed our relationship in 30 seconds. We need to reset our culture ASAP. I don't care! You come into my house, do I have to talk to my sister like that? Get out! Get, Get out. out! We must go! I do not. Take orders from me. Inshallah. wanted to show it to you to show you how some of the computer-based training is, is changing and that one is, um, is there's another one on Ethiopia and Kenya that deals with Somalia um, and I'm going to now contrast with some of the earlier material that, 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 that was produced I mean as an anthropologist I watched that video and I just like <laughs> I have to take deep breaths because I mean, it's such a sort of a stereotypical orientalist kind of complete with the music. I mean, it's also Hollywood and it's beautifully produced and done, but it's like, like if they could, yeah. And then they, they you know, you think about, everyone thinks of Afghanistan as a particularly horrible and dangerous place, but then they also say, you know, Afghanistan is a cultural, mi a cultural minefield as well. So then all of a sudden culture becomes sort of dangerous too, and it's, there's sort of some problematic <clears throat> things, to say, the, to say the least. But this is what, when I asked and interviewed people in 2006, this um, Iraqi culture smart card, Iraq culture smart card, was what most of them said that they had been provided with by, by the military, as, as well as training either by their chaplain um, or some other kind of short lecture. It wasn't very long. For, this was for the, for the early years. Now, the, the Iraq Culture Smart Card is a Marine one and, a, and a, um, an Army one. Um, Sorry, you have to. I tried that, didn't work. Smart cards are common in the military, they, they have them for lots of things. This is a basic combat training smart card, and I just put it up so you would. No, that the Iraq one is not exceptional. Um, oh, okay, work this time. This is the Iraq Culture Smart Card. They fold um, along this line here and this line here, so they end up being about this big. You can put them in your in your pocket. Um, I'll I'll get closer to it. So, so this was one one side was this sort of religion, religious holidays, clothes and gestures, ethnic groups, cultural groups, cultural customs, and cultural <coughs> history. This was the uh, the other side on, I have about five copies of these, different copies of these, they, they have different things. Some have pictures of IEDs so you can identify them. Others have, this has Arabic um, commands, numbers, questions, helpful words, phrases, the do this and the don't do this part, the social structure, and then understanding Arabic names. So it's really sort of, sort of basic, something you can pull out of your pocket, look at, and, and use. And I think a lot of it is actually really good information, the Arabic, et cetera. They've got information about the, the five pillars of Islam, um, the practice, practices based on these five pillars. Not sure why Islamic flag meanings are here, and then Islamic religions, religious terms. So it sort of tells you some of the kind of differences. Then it's got this clothes and gestures, um, and um, this is where you can see that I, I mean. I'm, when I show this to people who know anything about the Arab world, they actually start laughing. I mean, I can make a whole room sort of laugh in horror about what this says. I mean, the fact that somebody wears a white kafia, hatta, hotra, whatever you want to call it, the headscarf, signifies that they have not made the Hajj or pilgrimage to Mecca is ludicrous. Normally, I show a picture of um, the king of Saudi Arabia in a white headscarf. Like if anybody's made the pilgrimage, it's him. 
the black and white one is from a country with presidential rule, for example, Libya or Egypt, and has made the Hajj. I mean, this is just so meaningless. And I mean, they don't even wear this in Egypt, let alone. Yeah, why? what it has to do with presidential rule. And then the red checkered one is from a country with a monarch, for example, Saudi Arabia or Jordan, and has also made the Hajj. I don't know where they got this stuff from. I mean, it's, yeah, I, I, I honestly, I mean, I've never even heard this stuff. The, the Jordanian army does wear the red one, and it seems to be kind of more red is Jordanian and black and white is Palestinian, if you kind of want to do that stuff. But inside Palestine, red and white, the uh, Gafia is, is the, is the PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, whereas black and white is Fatah. I mean, it goes in so many different levels. But essentially, these are basically just like baseball hats. I mean, if you think of them that way, then they have a lot more meaning, that people wear them because they want to wear one. They wear one because it's their favorite team. They wear one because it was given to them by their father. I mean, it's, yeah, OK. But, but to go back to my point of sort of the issue of nation building, I think this slide um, in particular on the smart card um, sort of signified what, how the Americans were thinking of and approaching Iraq. And this looks like on the surface it would be kind of interesting and helpful and useful. The cultural, they're cultural groups, um, and they are Arabs, Shia and Sunni Arab, Kurds, Assyrians, Chaldeans, and Turkmen. But when you actually start to read it, I find it much, I find it horribly sort of insidious. Arabs view Kurds as separatists, and they are wary of them. They view the Christian Assyrians and Chaldeans as Iraqis, but recent Islamic extremism has sparked some hostility towards them. Arabs look down upon the Turkmen, and Arabs view Iranian Persians negatively. Next box, tension exists between Shia and Sunni. Sunnis blame Shia, Shia blame Sunnis. The Kurds, the Kurds are openly hostile. Kurds are distrustful of Turkmen, and Kurds do not interact much with Assyrians and Chaldeans. The Assyrians were persecuted by Kurds and Arabs. They have these sorts of things. The Chaldeans, they distrust both Kurdish and Arab intentions, but they have peaceful relationships with the, with the Turkmen. Yeah, like Allahu Akbar, finally somebody who like, gets like somebody else. In this <laughs> and then the Turkmen like, view themselves as a, of a repressed minority. They fear the Kurds, and they're identified with Turkey. If you're a U.S. service member, and this is what you're given, and you're told to go put your life on your on the line to go fight for these people and fight, you've just tried to liberate, you've just liberated their country, and this is what you're handed, you would kind of wonder what you're doing. Is this, is this, they all hate each other, so why am I here? And this is kind of what I've really tried to get at in this project of doing this is I'm... It's, it's difficult for me as an individual to trace the larger kind of where does this strategy come from and who makes it and that sort of stuff. But as an anthropologist, what I've been interested in is that how does it trickle down to the actual person on the ground who has to pull this card out of their pocket and talk to Iraqis or go, you know, pound on the doors of their houses and try and find things and actually make sense of what they have been taught and what they have been given. Um, and I would say that it's, it's really problematic. I mean, Lots of the, so I interviewed in 2006 about 50 people, and then in 2011 and 12 I interviewed another 30. Um, and they, 2012 was, was different, plus they were, we were, we were out of Iraq, and so I was doing much more Afghanistan uh, stuff. But many of the people that I spoke to were like, I don't know why we're there. You know, they all hate each other anyway. And of course this was a, you know, a difficult time in Iraq. But this, coupled with um, Joe Biden was very forward in talking about the sort of making it a federalist three, dividing it up along Shia, um, Sunni, and Kurdish, um, dividing the state up in those three ways, as well as this idea of nation building, as well as kind of this sort of, sort of constant refrain of sectarianism, I think really undermined kind of, obviously, Iraqis' sense of self and sovereignty and who they were, but it also undermined the actual mission in Iraq for the military and what they had been sent for. And I, I raised some of this. I've done a couple of presentations, um, one of which I did to a large, what turned out to be a large group of military, even though I didn't know they were going to be there. Um, and 
I've heard this a couple of times from people, and I, and I quote various members of, of the military who I interviewed, um, among them sort of non-officer non types, well, non-officer ranks, um, and then they and then and, and they say, you know, this was, you know, I don't, I don't know why we're there, and this is a real problem, and you know, these sorts of things. And I have actually had people, officers, generals, others with ranks, say, why are you quoting those people? They don't know what's going on. And my response is, well, why are you sending them there then? I mean, it's like, you know, if you're not going to prepare these people to do it, to to have the most tools with them with their job. Then, then you know it, you shouldn't sort of be sending them into these kinds of situations. And um, so, I part of what I have sort of come to learn is about sort of the hierarchies in which who sort of has a voice and who speaks within these kind of military um, frameworks about sort of training and about kind of preparation, et cetera. I think you want me to stop in about five minutes. Is that? Right. Fine, but you can go on a little. I mean, if, okay. if you've got more to present, you should present. I've got it. So, this this smart card was handed out and um, <clears throat> went on through 2009. And then in 2009, I saw that as we were getting ready to withdraw from Iraq in 2010, um, there were thousands of them available on eBay. Um, somebody was selling them in in, in bulk. Um, so they clearly had, they were, but, but I mean, like a million of them were produced and distributed at least based on this um, research. So the U.S. Army Tradoc, um, which is based in Fort Huachuca, produced a number of these smart cards and they also started producing smart books, which are spiral bound and about the same size, but have a lot more information in them. And <coughs> they have, tried to remove some of this more kind of analytical, evaluative language and tried to put more sort of straight factual language in this. So you see this one, for example, is now called Ethnic Groups, and it's the five ethnic groups in Afghanistan. This one is, so the, Tad, so sorry, the Pashtuns are um, Eastern Iranian ethnic linguistic group, located primarily in southeast Afghanistan and northwest Pakistan, majority in Afghanistan, and then some in pa Pakistan. Pashtuns are characterized by the use of the Pashtu language and practices of Pashtunwala, and they're fierce warriors and very dominant. So they go down through them in that sense. This is much more kind of descriptive. I'm still a little bit unclear as to what the, the point is. I'll put them up next to each other. What I mean, I guess it's useful information for people to know, but it's um, it's still the pictures then suggest that if you see somebody wearing a particular scarf or looking a particular way, that then they are going to be of this group. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily. I'm not an Afghan Afghanistan expert, so I'm not sure that that's really um, necessarily helpful. Um, this is, so the TRADOC Culture Center has kind of adopted and they are doing um, books and other things for all of these kinds of the areas of the world. So this was, in, um, this was in 2010. They had decided that this culture sort of trend was the way to go. Um, let me just shift to my kind of final point here. So I think there are two issues that, that are that are sort of crucial to how this cultural training in the military and the whole sort of conception of culture has played out. And I was sort of alerted to it by the people that I was doing interviews with in 2011, with the, with the veterans and, um, and, in, and military. And they were saying, some people were like, well, culture's not really important. We don't really want to do this. You know, it's really much more about sort of force of arms and you know, getting control of things. Whereas others said, I have to interact with Afghans all the time. It's really helpful to have this, this kind of material, and I wish I had more of it. But as I asked them more questions, and as I kind of explored more sources, it seems that what 
they're now getting much better training, longer hours at it, better, more, more language. People from a particular unit um, will get chosen to get more training and get, get, become kind of the sort of culture or linguistic expert in that. But, but what the, um, the GAO put out a report on this subject, um, and then I also found it via my interviews, is the training they received and these sort of cultural skills that they have are not being put into their personnel record. So that when they're actually being sent on deployments, those skills are not being taken into consideration. So one guy that I interviewed had, now I'm going to get, I'm going to get it turned around. He had studied, you know, 11 weeks of Dari, and he was sent to an area where there were no Dari speakers. So his skills and his 11 weeks and all that were completely useful, useless. It may have been the other way around. He may have studied Pashto and was sent to a Dari speaking area. I can't remember which one it was. But, but his, but his the the kind of the connection between what they have learned outside of their military operations specialty, outside of you know their their military stuff, is now not being put into their personnel records. So they are kind of you know it, it's almost like extra credit if they can do it, and if and if it is actually useful by, by the time they get to the other the place where they're going. Um, and then finally, I think the final point, and um, and I would be interested to those, but those of you that know the military and, and sort of where it's where it's going and what it's thinking, is I think the whole issue of drones has kind of made this sort of culture stuff and culture and war now less relevant than it ever was before, because. Well, there will still be people on the ground, and they will, they're doing, I think, a very good job of really trying to work and train um, military officers in some of these skills that will then be passed down to, their, to, the, to the men and women in their units. This whole way of invading countries or of having to really engage with the population to get at something seems to be kind of on its way out and instead drone warfare and kind of targeted assassinations and surveillance via drones is much more, I think, going to be the norm, um, at least if the current last year or two is, um, is any indication. Now, whether that will mean cultural brokers will be trained as observers and not actually having to interact with human beings, but actually being able to understand via kind of watching people now, who they are, what the means, what, you know, these sorts of things, that will be an interesting development. I mean, the one thing that the military never, ever, ever seemed to get in all of this, um, there were sort of two things. One, um, and this is where the drones are, are sort of relevant, one is that they never kind of got issues of power. They never really understood that they're the, like, I, I in the paper, I have links to some of the videos, but when, you know, a, a group of large men in full body armor with helmets and helmet cams and lots of guns and gloves and dark glasses sort of appear on a site and they start asking an Iraqis or Afghans questions, they don't necessarily understand that people are going to tell them what they think they want to hear because they're terrified by that. And instead, they, they end up saying, well, all, I mean, I had people say this, inter interviewees say this to me, well, the Iraqis, they all lie. You know, they just, they just tell you what you want to hear. And I, the, the kind of un, the inability to sort of see what that um, might mean is, is a kind of still astounds me. But the other thing that the, that the military never sort of addressed was that Iraqi culture is not static, or Afghan culture, or any culture is not static. And that what happened when the U.S. military came in was um, the Iraqis started changing and started adapting. And so these early training things that said, for example, like, don't give the thumbs up sign because that's rude in Iraq. <laughs> and it sort of is rude if you kind of do it in a way where it's rude. Um, but to have a whole bunch of American soldiers sort of clearly being sort of happy and sort of giving, you know, teddy bears to children and going doing the thumbs up sign, Iraqis quickly learn that the thumbs up sign in American means good, right? 
but that that never sort of that that it, the idea that the Iraqis could ever change and learn and adapt um, was was never kind of addressed. And I was talking to a journalist friend who who was in Iraq for a long time, and he said, you know, he said now it's really interesting. The young men in Iraq, the ones who sort of want to be cool, they um, wear sunglasses, and like nobody. The Arab world doesn't tend to wear sun. The Arab they don't wear sunglasses. So to kind of now wear sunglasses was now a sign that you were like a cool young man, sort of modeled on this this sort of masculinity of of American soldiers. They also um, they also started getting haircuts in certain ways that were sort of very naughty, rocky. And um, he he said that um, foreigners were now no they were no longer being called Ajanib. In some of the, which means foreigners, in some of the, um, some of the ways people were talking about them, they would say, "Oh yeah, that guy. You, oh, you mean the DOD guy over there?" They would say this in Arabic, and so DOD had become like the sort of word for, um, for foreigner. So this whole, which terrified me, I have to say, this whole way that Iraqi culture is sort of responding to these kind of, the presence of Americans, and and I don't know Afghanistan well enough, but I'm sure Afghan culture is doing the same thing, that 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 is sort of missing in all of these kinds of trainings, and yet both the Iraqis and Afghans sort of are aware of it, as well as many of the troops. I mean, many of the troops responded, and they were like, you know, they don't care if you do this. They, you know, they know you, and they know what it means, and it's, it's totally fine with them. So somehow these kinds of, kind of the power and the sort of the non-static um, <coughs> character of, the, of Iraqi and Afghan culture have never been sort of either mentioned or captured or understood. That's it. Thank you.